Hello YouTubers and welcome to this quick tech video on the Veloman or Veloman HPS 140i handheld pocket oscilloscope. It's a tiny 10 megahertz oscilloscope with some fiddly buttons on the front but it may hold a few surprises for some. So let's get it to the bench and have a closer look. Right, so a quick bit of information on it. At this point in time, February 2014, you can find these for about $120 on Amazon. I will have them in my Amazon store. I'll have a link below. On the box, it states it's a 10 megahertz oscilloscope, 40 mega samples per second real time, high sensitivity, 0.1 millivolt. It apparently does do audio power measurements and it gives the uh, impedance or resistance levels there. We'll have a look at that. It claims a digital voltmeter, questionable. Record function, that's something we'll have a look at. Uh, signal markers, it's got six hour battery life with a nickel metal high drive rechargeable battery. It's then got full auto setup function. Again, we'll have a look at that. And then it's got a hold and store function as well. What you get in the box is obviously the little pocket oscilloscope itself. It's got a nice red protective rubber jacket around it. It does have a test signal for a 10 times Pro. It has these four buttons which are used for navigating the features. There are screws in the back, so you should be able to open it up and get to the battery pack. You then do get a single probe. Obviously, it's just one channel. It is a 10 times slash one times probe rated for up to 60 megahertz. You obviously get a little manual, a very basic manual in several languages. You get a USB charging device that actually provides nine volts to charge the battery pack inside the meter. You get the clip-on piece for your Pro. You get your compensation adjustment tool and some color coding for the cables. At the top of the scope, you'll find the power on off switch, the nine volt input to charge the batteries, and then obviously your BNC for your probe. At power up, it shows you the Veloman or Veloman little logo and then comes up with your oscilloscope screen. The backlight is permanently on and I assume it does that because it obviously needs it to uh, bring out the LCD correctly. Probably the biggest challenge with a scope like this is the navigation because of the availability of space, real estate and the keys that you get to use. So you've got a set of keys which adjust functions up or down or select values. You've got a hold key that can also save a signal to two memory slots. And then you've got your menu key. The menu is rather challenging at first because you have to know how to navigate it. It only pops on the screen for a short while and you quickly have to use your navigation keys to get around to change any settings. To access the menu, you hold down the key briefly. It then brings up this menu and immediately you have to start making your selections or else it disappears very quickly. So then these two keys, the menu key and the hold key, provide steps through the actual menu, menu system itself. And the up and down keys will change values. So if I go up here and set that to 10 times probe, which is what I've got selected, then that's how you do it. And then it exits automatically. Once you get the knack of it, it's okay, but it certainly is quirky when you're trying to make adjustments. Now at the moment, I've got it set to a quick menu function, which will allow me to change the volts per division and the time base on the actual display itself without having to go into the menu. So if you see, when I push the menu key now, I've got volts displayed and I can toggle through my volt setting, a time base, or the coupling mode. The coupling mode you've got, obviously you've got a ground mode, an AC mode, or a DC mode. Once you're in your settings for your voltage or time base, you can then manually go and change those settings and zoom in and manually set your parameters to best view your signal. Likewise, again, if I go to the time base, I can then go and change the time base for viewing the signal. On the side, it does have a little marker where your trigger is set to. It obviously shows your time base that you're in a run mode, you can have a normal or an auto trigger, which is the run, and then obviously your volts per division. You can go to fully automatic mode by simply entering into the menu, hold down the key, and it'll set to auto volt and auto time. When these are then highlighted as they are now, they'll automatically change according to the signal. So if I change the frequency of the signal, You'll note that the time base will automatically adjust to keep the signal in view. 
Likewise, if I change the amplitude, it will adjust the volts per division to allow you to completely view the signal. So for a novice or someone very new, this might be handy. You don't have to push an auto hold feature. It will automatically adjust to this signal within reason to allow you to get the best view of a signal. But you can obviously go to the manual mode and make your own adjustments. One of the settings that is very fiddly to change in this menu system is your trigger. You can obviously change your trigger level. You have to push the menu button and then navigate to your trigger. And then you can see I can make the adjustment on the side here, setting it higher or lower. But you'll note in this mode, because it's, I've got the full menu up, you can have a shortened menu, but here to get the trigger level, I cannot see what's happening with the signal underneath. So you merely have to guess, release, wait, and then see whether you've got your trigger in the right place. If, we, if I hold down and go back into menu, there's a setting where we got menu off. If I go to menu on, It'll bring up a short menu when I just push the key over here. But that trigger is not on there. If I want to go back to the long menu, I then have to depress this for two seconds. Then I get the full menu. However, in this mode, I'm then locked to changing the setting with these keys, which is here. So at the moment I'm on volts, pushing the menu key is not going to switch that between the time base and the coupling. I'd have to go in and manually adjust that in the menu system. The other notable issue that I have found with this scope, you can obviously have your time base in seconds per division and then obviously your volts per division, but you cannot set frequency. You can take measurements, which I'll demonstrate now, and from that, from the period, you can work out frequency, but nowhere are you able to display the frequency of the wave on the actual scope screen itself. The scope does allow you to capture or hold a waveform and save it into memory, and you can make measurements. You mean if you push the hold button, it has now held the signal. You can see the dotted lines around it. And this is when you can go into your measurement mode. So if I push the menu button now, I can go set my voltage markers for the amplitude and the time base markers. So at the moment, it's set to V1. If you can see I'm adjusting down the top line. I can bring that to the top of the wave. I can then go and say, click through to get to V2. And pull that up and in the bottom of the display here, you can see that it's actually got a delta value displaying the amplitude of the actual signal. Now the signal that I'm putting in here, it happens to be 10 volts. And if I get that top and bottom, you can see it is showing you exactly 10 volts. We can also go and do the time base. So I'll go to the T2 marker. You can see the cursor coming across. I'll set it to the bottom of the wave over there. I go to the T1 marker. I can then go set that at my desired point and I can see the delta value, the delta time value down in the bottom of the screen. And from that you can obviously work out frequency. By holding the hold button, you'll see it notes MEM1. That has stored this waveform into memory one. I can then go back to the live view by pushing the hold button, capture another signal and put it into memory point two. Here I have a square wave on the screen. Again, if I push the hold button, the previous settings that I've set are still there. So if I wanted to compare measurements of two waves, I can bring them up and then have the marker still on the screen. But here we have a square wave. Again, so if I hold this now, you'll see it says mem one. What it's done, it shifted the sine wave into MEM2 and put the square in MEM1. If you want to recall them, you simply push down the menu button and cycle through until you get to memory. And then, as you can see, I can with these buttons select which waveform I want to have a look at. So I can go back to the sinusoidal wave, have a look at two waves and compare measurements if I wanted to. Now we'll just have a look at the kind of limits of the bandwidth of the little scope and just demonstrate the kind of auto feature. Uh, currently I've got the time base and volts per division set to manual. I've got a sinusoidal wave coming in at one megahertz. What I'm gonna do is go to the menu system and change to auto. The scope then manages to 
settle on the automatic settings to display that signal correctly. What we're going to test now is we're going to step it up towards 10 megahertz, which is what its quoted bandwidth input is, and see how well it copes. You'll note it's already at 250 nanoseconds per division, and that is its limit on the time base. You'll see the frequency increasing. We're now up to 5 megahertz. If I had to hold the wave at this point in time and freeze it, it still seems like a manageable signal to have a look at. We can obviously zoom in on the voltage level, but on the time division, you stuck it where it is right now. We'll go back to the live view. Once we start getting to six, seven, the wave, in my opinion, becomes difficult to read and deal with. But approaching nine or 10 is going to be a little bit of a challenge working at the top end of its bandwidth. In my opinion, it seems more useful at five megahertz or below. I've now got a sinusoidal signal and I've set the period to 60 seconds. So here is the one little interesting feature that this scope does have. It notes that it's a digital recorder. And in effect, what you can do is measure signals over a long time. If you're, let's say, measuring the discharge of a capacitor or a battery, you can get the time base to go really low. So if I go to a manual time base and start adjusting down, I've got to one second per division. I've now set it to 30 seconds per division. And as you can see, it is slowly starting to chart out the signal of the sine wave that is coming in. In this case, my voltage level could be a little bit better. But you can go down to one hour per division. So this, in theory, will allow you, they say, 46 hours of recording on the screen, which actually may be helpful for some people. There certainly, most scopes don't allow you that kind of time base to give you that much recording on the display. The other interesting feature that this little scope does have is that it can display audio power measurements. So if I've got this little MP3 player, I'll push play. It has a song playing, which I've got connected to the scope probe, so we can see the kind of audio signal on the display. I can then go into the menu and go and select to display audio power measurements. Now, the other measurements there, you can go and display your uh, voltage, uh, peak to peak, Vmax, Vmin, logarithmic, and now I'm going to say what's RMS at a 2 ohm value. And then down here you'll see it actually displaying the microwatts for a 2 ohm value. If I increase the volume, you'll see now we're up to 1.7, 1.3 odd milliwatts for a 2 ohm value. Right then, so that's a quick overview of the little filament scope, pocket scope meter. Um, I think if you are a hobbyist working at the bench, you would seriously want to look at spending that money even secondhand on a proper bench scope so that you've got proper functionality and ease of use. The button and navigation on the front can be very fiddly. However, if you're on a really tight budget or you needed the portability, this might be a consideration. I certainly found when I checked the measurements with the scope versus my signal generator and my a pyramid generator, it was measuring spot on. So it certainly didn't seem to have any issue with its kind of measurement or accuracy that you're able to do on this little device. But anyway, thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you soon for the next one. Cheers.